Johannesburg, and a hot summer sun beats down on the city preparing to stage the first World Championship race of 1970. South African enthusiasts are on hand in thousands to see the world's top Formula One stars jet into the circuit at Kyalami. For them, it's the biggest event of the year. As a South African, um, obviously I feel very uh, proud and honoured that um, world-class racing drivers think uh, enough of us to come out to South Africa and to race in this. Graham Hill, of course, is, I think, the star at this stage because he's putting up a terrific effort with his both his legs that have been broken. The South Africans greeted Hill as a hero. His first drive in a racing car since his crippling crash in America last October seemed nothing short of miraculous. I'm having a little trouble uh, stopping the car. You know, my leg isn't strong enough to work the old brake too well, and um, so I'm having to brake fairly early, which is a bit of a disadvantage. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it doesn't seem to be getting too tired. And um, so, as is the first one of the uh, season and the one I've been aiming at, I thought I'd have a go. The world champions number on a march. A brand new body, Ford Cosworth engine. After over 800 miles of testing, Jackie Stewart knew what he and teammate Johnny Servo Gavin could expect of the new machinery. Fastest in practice, Stewart was trying out a new tyre designed especially for conditions at Kyle Army. How different was it? Well, it's a slightly different construction. In this case, it's a slightly different tread pattern itself, more stable. Stability is very important on a circuit where you have change of direction corners, like for instance down at the S's, uh, where you're going from left to right. Now it's very important for you to be able to do this positively, and of course the tyre plays a very big part in this. Which drivers have been pressed in the new machinery you've seen here this time? Well, they're all trying a bit too hard to impress me right now. Uh, I'd like them to take it a bit easier and just behave themselves. I see. You think it could be a bit of a hairy battle? <laughs> South African Grand Prix this uh, this far and I think it'll be a very exciting race. I just hope it's uh, not too exciting. Stewart predicted the race would be won on tyres. If he was right, Firestone might make all the difference to Swiss driver Joe Sippert in the Marchworks team after leaving Rob Walker at the end of last season. For the first race of 1970, there would be no fewer than five marches on the grid. One of them driven by the man around whom the car was originally designed one-time winner of Le Mans, Kiwi Chris Amon, still looking for a Grand Prix win after an unlucky year with Ferrari. And Mario Andretti, last year's winner of Indianapolis, driving March in his first full season of Formula One. Track temperatures up to 135 degrees gave tire men plenty to think about. Goodyear G20s for the Brabham, another brand new car racing under brand new colors. This is Brabham's first Formula One monocoque, distinctive with its big oil tank at the rear, the kind of car that in 1970 will make the 43-year-old Australian one of the hardest men to beat. You've been around for rather more seasons than I care to remember. Have you ever known a season as exciting at the start as this one? No, I think this is probably going to be the best season we've had for many a year. You ever seen so many new cars about? No, and I've never seen so many good cars about either. <laughs> Which do you think are the really good ones, Jack, the Brabham apart? Um, well, it's a bit difficult to choose, actually. I think the best thing to do is wait until the race tomorrow, and then we might see. Also in the race would be Brabham number 14, bringing the white racing colours of Germany back to Grand Prix for the first time since the legendary Von Trips. The driver, young Cologne-born Rolf Stommelen. The new McLaren M14, one of two team cars for New Zealander Bruce McLaren, driving in his 100th Grand Prix at the age of only 32, and another for ex-world champion Denny Hull. Denny, you ended last season with a tremendous victory. You're now here going very quickly with a brand new car. Does this mean it's going to be McLaren's season? Well, once hoping so. Uh, we have a much bigger project going this year, both for Can Am, Indianapolis and Grand Prix. I think we're going to divide the effort a little bit more towards Grand Prix racing and see if we can't do a better job. One can't expect the other competitors to come down to our level, we've got to get up to their level and I think, I think we can do it. We have a new car, it seems to be running well, no real problems as yet. Mechanically it's quite sound and safe, but most of the running gear is off the Can-Am or something similar. We've used it for two years now. Um, I'd say we have a very basic and sound car. How much better is the new car than last year's car? Well, the only circuit we've actually had that where we can do a comparison is Goodwood 
and it is about one and a half like, seconds a lap quicker. Now we thought we'd go a lot quicker than we're going here, but for some reason we can't really pinpoint it what the difference is, except they have removed the wings off the uprights and put them on the chassis and this may have caused something. There's one or two trick things on the car that nobody's really spotted yet, and we're not saying what they are. Um, it's quite clever designs here and there, but it is just a basically it's a very sound motor car. Holm found access easier with this steering wheel design from the new McLaren Indianapolis car. Other improvements on the M14? Inboard disc brakes at the rear and better suspension at the front. Colin Chapman's Lotus 72 was one new car that did not appear at Kailami. Instead, with the promise that it would be ready to go to Spain in April, he had entered two of last year's 49 Cs. What did the prospects look like to number one Lotus driver, Jochen Rindt? We're going to have a new car for the Spanish Grand Prix, and the car is going to be tested about two weeks before. And it would have been a mad rush to get the new car here, and I'm, I'm quite happy with the old car, it's going quite well. <laughs> You've had a very good chance to look at the new cars on the track. Which of them impresses you most? Actually, none of them impresses me very much because they're all the same. I mean, they're all, you know, no, nothing really new. They all look like just a little bit, you know, better modifications on it. And our car, the new load, is going to be quite different. If it's, if it, if it's going to go as quick as it looks, I think it's going to be a good car. Mexican-born Pedro Rodriguez, after a brief stay with Ferrari, was back with BRM starting their 26 year of racing with a new extremely light car the brm team were hoping for great things from the powerful v12 engine how much difference did jackie oliver notice in the new p153 well, normally when you drive a uh, a person's car like a lotus one year um, and then you drive the same a, a new model the following year they have the same characteristics you know a lotus feels like a lotus whether it's the new model or the old model and a brabham always was like a brabham but the BRM didn't carry this straight this time. It doesn't feel like a BRM, it feels completely different. Probably because it is. Does it feel a lot better? It's a lot quicker, I know that. <laughs> what sort of a season do you think BRM will really have this time? Well, I think, I think we're gonna give the Fools a fair run for their money. I, I think we believe we've got a good chassis. It's certainly down to weight. And um, I spoke to a very ex excited engineer on the phone three days ago and he's come up with a modification on our V12s that has given us comparable brake horsepower figures and torque figures for the Ford, so it should look good for the Spanish Grand Prix in a few weeks' time. The new Ferrari first appeared at Monza last September, in time for the Italian Grand Prix, but engine problems kept it out of the race, and so the South African crowds would be the first to see it compete. It has a small chassis powered by a flat 12 engine, which Ferrari claim produces 460 brake horsepower. The last time Ferrari won a Grand Prix was in 1968. Then, as now, the driver was Jackie X, who was optimistic about his chances of success. Why? The design of the car is completely different now, especially because the design of the engine. Uh, before it was a V12 engine, now it's a flat 12, and completely new design. And, uh, The chassis is quite revolutionary for Ferrari, isn't it? It's a very nice chassis, it's very, very small. I think one of the smallest cars here with the McLaren. And uh, I think it's really uh, going to be very quick in the straight. In 1969, Stewart won the World Championship with Matra. This year, their name is linked with Simca of France. And at Kyalami, they produce two new MS120 cars powered by a much-revised version of the Matra V12, which French engineers reckoned would make them highly competitive. But in practice, their best times were nearly a second slower than Stuart and Eamon in the March cars. Still driving for Matra, as he did last year, 32-year-old Jean-Pierre Beltoise was partnered in the second team car by 27-year-old Henri Pescarolo. In Italian red, the new Di Tommaso car was entered by the 27-year-old independent Frank Williams. Lightweight chassis, Ford Cosworth engine, and one-time BRM team driver Piers Courage would be at the wheel. Distinctive new colours too on the McLaren M7C, which was entered by John Surtees. Like many of the other cars, outboard tanks took the extra fuel, in this case 48 gallons. But for Surtees, world champion in 1964, there is the possibility of a new car later in the year. Team 
Gunston colours were carried by two of the three South African entries. Lotus number 23 was driven by a man who has won the South African Championship six times, John Lowe, a man who more than any other must have felt at home at Kyalami. Two and a half miles in 80 seconds, top speed nearly 180 miles an hour, 80 laps over 200 miles. The first race in the 1972 Grand Prix season. The time, a few minutes before three o'clock, with a wildly excited crowd of 100,000 people. Surely one of the most colorful circuits in the world and one of the most demanding. This promises to be the best pipe opener of any season in motor racing history. There are no fewer than 16 new cars amongst the 23 starters, and no fewer than 11 of the drivers have changed seats to new teams. The lap record has been busted wide open by no fewer than 19 of the drivers in some scorching practice. All the drivers say it's going to be a highly exciting race. Some of them say it's going to be perhaps too exciting. All we know is that they can't wait for it to start. Pole position, Stewart in the Tyrrell entered March. Beside him, Eamon works March. Equal best in practice with 1 minute 19.3 seconds. Third on the grid, Brabham. 0.3 of a second slower than the marches. Watch on the right as Eamon moves out. Rint crashes across his nose, hits Brabham, and ends up off the track, unhurt, but trailing in a badly bent car. In the confusion, Stewart seizes the lead and heads through Barbecue, Yuxke, Sunset Clubhouse and the Esses, on and up to Liukov. straight and past the pits, a blur at nearly 180 miles an hour. Crowthorne, lap two, first Stewart, second X. Beltoir takes Oliver to snatch third place. Cop, lap two. It's Stewart, then Ix, Beltoise, Oliver, McLaren, Brabham, Siffert, Surtees, Charlton, Holm. Into the kink, Stewart three seconds ahead of Ix and still pulling away. But Brabham is making up for lost time. And Graham Hill is settling down well. Brabham, breathing down Ix's neck, takes him as they break for Crowthorne. Brabham 2, Ix 3, Beltoise, McLaren, Holm and Surtees. But Stewart is way out on his own, nearly seven seconds ahead, and there's no threat yet from Brabham. The BRM's gears bring Oliver in on lap eight. By lap 22, he'll be out of the race for good. Rodriguez is next. On lap 10, he's forced to stop with the engine misfiring. The BRM pit can put it right, but the time will cost them dearly. The ignition box is changed as priceless minutes are lost. Lap 12, Brabham chasing Stewart, X third, then McLaren and Holm, who's moved up to fifth. Then come Beltoise, Siffert, Surtees, with Charlton and Rent fighting for ninth. the race was finished for Eamon, his march in the pits with a split radiator. Meanwhile, Stewart's lead over Brabham was narrowing. But 
have behind them a gap before X in the Ferrari, the two McLarens, the Beltois Matra, the Civic March and the Surtees McLaren. Clubhouse to the S's. Brabham rides in the world champion's mirror. Full bore past the crowds on lap 19. The two cars still race nose to tail. In the Brabham pit there's the smell of success. And coming out at Crowthorn, the Australian has seized the lead from the Scot. And there are 60 laps to go. Behind the world champion, McLaren is now third, home is fourth, and Ix has slipped to fifth, leaving Surtees, Sifford and Beltoise to battle further back. Pierce Courage in the Italian de Tommaso was going well, but he couldn't do better than 15th. On lap 39, he would be forced to retire with a bent front and rear suspension, cause when the throttle stuck open and he ran out of road. With Sifford and Surtees having their own race, things began to happen at Neocop. After thrilling the home crowd with a surprisingly good performance against the bigger names, Dave Charlton got it all wrong in the South African lens at Lotus. Charlton carried on and would last until tyre problems put him out, only seven laps from the end. The excitement wasn't over. Minutes later, the South African de Klerk ended up sideways in his Brabham with a dead engine. Surprisingly, he managed to get it going again and would end up finishing the race. By lap 30, the field was thinning out. Andretti's march with radiator problems had stopped for the afternoon and Stomlin retired his Brabham because of an ominous vibration in the engine department. But when at last Denny Holm passed Stewart into second place, it was a signal for jubilation from Pat McLaren. The success of McLaren number six was tempered with disappointment when Bruce McLaren in number five put up his hand to retire from his 100th Grand Prix on lap 39 with an engine fault, either a valve mechanism or timing gears. Now there was a fight for fifth place between Ix, Sifford and Beltoise. For a time, Ix held on. And then on lap 53, the order changed and it was Siffert, Ix, Beltoise. But at Leocop, near disaster, Siffert spun, hitting Ix and allowing Beltoise through into fifth place. Both Ferrari and March lipped for home. Siffert would finish after having a bent exhaust cut off, but Ix was out on lap 60 with his engine trailing oil. Troubles were not over for BRM either. George Eaton retired on lap 59 with a broken engine, leaving only Rodriguez to carry the flag and finish the race. But as Brabham came in for the laurels, over-eager pressmen and supporters turned the welcome into confusion, as at least one cameraman would have good cause to remember later. But what did Brabham think of the race? Uh, well, actually, I had a little incident in the very first lap and uh, Rint ran over my front wheel and uh, this put me back quite a bit on the first lap because I was worried he may have done some damage to the car, so I took it easy for a few laps until I made sure the wheel wasn't going to fall off. Uh, actually, it was terrific. The car went fantastically well. For a brand new motor car, we're fantastically pleased. I think the boys have done a fantastic job preparing it. Take it. This really was the race that must fortify the over 40s. For not only did Jack Brabham win it, but Graham Hill, the man we didn't think would probably be racing until October, finished sixth and earned a world championship point. For Jack Brabham, adulation. For others, a sad trip back to the drawing board. But for spectators, surely a mere hors d'oeuvre for what promises to be one of the most richly spiced Grand Prix seasons in history. <laughs>